So hello, everybody. Uh, this is I'm Paul Jeffries with Arbor Gen, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come with us and join us on our Halloween edition of webinar uh, today. And I'd like to wish everybody a happy Halloween. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a, a topic that I get asked quite frequently. Uh, I probably get uh, at least one or two calls uh, a week asking how many trees should I be planting per acre? And am I planting too many trees per acre? Or uh, if I lower my planting density, am I going to uh, affect the way that my trees grow? So we're gonna cover that topic today uh, in our webinar. And at the end, we're going to have a section that is for Q&A. So if you have any questions at the end, please type your questions into the Q&A section and uh, me or my colleagues at the end of the presentation will be glad to take those questions and answer them, answer them for you to the best of our ability. So with that being said, I'd like to get into the presentation today and uh, get started. First, I'd like to start out by uh, talking about some of the, the markets that we are having or we're seeing uh, the dynamic markets uh, for pulp and paper uh, around the southeast. Uh, we're constantly hearing uh, new uh, news about uh, mills closing or mills uh, downsizing, pulp mills downsizing or pulp mills closing uh, across the southeast. It's not like it was back when uh, the pulp business was booming back in the 90s when there were a lot of uh, outlets where you could uh, market your pulp wood to and carry, them, carry your pulp wood uh, uh, quality trees. Those are just not, they're, they're not, it's not like it was. It's not like it was back then and it has changed. Just this recently, uh, this past, uh, uh, this month, there has been a uh, pulp mills have completely shut down. One international paper in Orange, Texas uh, has closed they, that announcement. Uh, Georgia Pacific has announced a, uh, a shutdown, complete shutdown of a pulp mill in Perry, Florida. Uh, the Pensacola International Paper Mill has uh, uh, downsized. They've closed one. They have one line down, and also the International uh, Paper Mill in Regalwood has downsized, and they've they've shut down one line. So what we're seeing in the markets across the southeast is we're seeing a lot of downsizing or outright closing of pulp facilities, and these the these uh, these these facilities are no longer going to be taking the uh, the low quality uh, pulp wood trees, and that's going to run into some cause some problems going forward at, with timber management by landowners in the southeast because we're going to have to adjust our timber management for those markets. We're going to have to adjust how we are approaching timber management. Uh, if you are a forester, I feel like we're going to be um, you know, uh, looking at different ways to uh, uh, secure revenue for our clients, your landowner, we're going to have to be looking at, at alternative methods of management and planting to uh, meet our objectives because uh, like you, I am a tree farmer myself. Uh, I own private property in, in, in North Alabama. And to be quite honest with you, we have some of the worst pulp markets in the southeast. I actually have a personal family stand that has had been due for a thinning uh, for quite a few years now. And just recently, I approached a logger that was working on a track close by and offered to, uh, to him if he would be willing to move on that I would just give him the pulp wood that was in the stand because the stand was planted 20 plus years ago. And uh, he respectfully declined. He did not want to move. His, it, it just wasn't worth him moving his equipment onto the property to get the pulp wood because the pulp wood was such low value uh, that it just it wouldn't benefit him. So I'm hearing I'm hearing discussion among foresters and landowners, and I'm even considering it myself of just cranking up my old steel chainsaw and and going through the stand and and start to doing some some thinning my own and uh, just laying the trees on the ground because it's reached a point in the stand where it has become stagnant. And I'm really concerned about some of the things that we're gonna talk about in this webinar. So <clears throat> if you would, um, 
Next slide. So this photo here is just a reminder of uh, how forestry and agriculture is a lot alike. Uh, this is a photo from, uh, to put it, put it mildly, this is my backyard. Uh, this is on my private farm here in North Alabama. Uh, we lease our farmland out to a farmer and this year he had a bumper cotton crop. Uh, it was just incredible. But if you look behind the cotton over there on the hillside, that's one of my tree farms on my personal property. And just like in uh, agriculture, agriculture years ago, uh, before the invention of or before uh, genetic advancement really took off in ag, and then you started dealing with the uh, uh, ground up ready ag crops. Uh, they were planting a lot more seed per acre than they are today. Uh, most people has heard the reference of the way the population is growing in the world, that we're going to have to have a lot more uh, agricultural crops just to keep the population fed and clothed. Well, it's like my grandfather used to say, when you want to buy some, if you're going to buy land, you need to buy land because they're not making any more of it. Well, just like what he said, they're not making any more farmland, so we're going to have to start using technology to increase our yields in, in, in crops such as corn, soybeans, and, and cotton. And that's the way this, this our, uh, the farmer that leases our land, that's what he has done in the past. That cotton you see there is a new genetic. Uh, in conversation with him, I've asked him how often does he change the genetic that he plants in the agricultural crops. And he says that he only uses the same uh, technology uh, in genetics two years at max uh, before he goes on to the next one. I've also talked to another farmer that has told me that the way they have increased their yield in cotton in the past is they're using higher genetics, but they've also decreased their planting density uh, in, the, in the cotton field. They have gotten down to where now they are only planting about three seed per linear bed foot uh, of cotton. And that's directly related to how we need to approach forestry now because we've gotten highly advanced in, in genetics in forestry, like you see in this stand here. We've gotten control pollinated seedlings, families now that are producing upwards of 70 to 80% saw logs and poles in the stand. And uh, basically that's the same thing as, as, as farming. Uh, now that we are producing way more uh, volume tonnage uh, uh, in, in, in timber, uh, we need to back off on our planting density. Uh, years ago when tree improvement first started in the 1950s, uh, tree improvement started that they, the, they, they were doing good to be producing five green tons per acre per year. Now with the genetic improvements that we've gotten with, with control pollinated seedlings and just open, highly improved open pollinated seedlings, our yields have increased where in some stands we're producing as much as 15 green tons per acre per year. So in order to do this, you have got to, uh, in order to achieve this, you've got to give the trees room enough to grow. And you've got to give them room enough to where their uh, genetic advancement uh, that they have inside them can actually display their cells. Now on this slide here on the left side, you see a stand that I made this photo of. It is an incredibly overstocked stand. That stand was first started with uh, some open pollinated base genetic seedlings, as you can tell from the limb characteristics in it. It also had some naturals to blow in. And what you've got there is you've got a stand that is just stagnant. And if you look at the size of the trees, they are actually below pulpwood sized timber. So that stand is not even merchantable now, and it is already struggling with trying to get available nutrients and trying to get uh, resources to grow and to produce the stand that uh, the landowner would like for it to produce for the quality products. Quite simply, it's not going to get there. Uh, the stand is going to have to have a, uh, a, an economic investment put into it by doing what's controlled called a pre-commercial thin or PCT. 
to have someone to go through there and just take out some of the trees so that the ones that are remaining can grow and can get reach that uh, marketable size. The stand that you see there in the center is an eight by 10 spacing, and that is uh, 545 trees per acre. Uh, as you can see, that stand is made up of a, an MCP or mass control pollinated genetic. Uh, you see the limbs, the trees are free to grow. Uh, but even at that spacing, the trees have reached the size where they are pulpwood size or even pushing a little bit higher to where they may be reaching into the chip and saw size. They're still, they have captured that site and uh, it will not be very long if it is not thin before it will start struggling for nutrients and, and water as well. The stand you see on the right side is a 10 by 10 spacing, which is 435 trees per acre. And as you can see, that stand is very well formed. Look at the tight crowns, look at the small limbs, look at how straight they are. Now, the eight by 10 and 10 by 10, both of those stands are higher genetics. Those are made up of controlled pollinated seedlings and they are going to produce upwards of 70 to 80% saw logs and poles in that stand if managed properly. Contrary to popular belief, just because you have a wider spacing doesn't necessarily mean that you are gonna have large limbs and large crowns. You're talking about a difference in, in spacing of maybe one, two, sometimes three feet difference. That's not gonna have the, the impact that a lot of people have the uh, misconception of uh, that their limbs are going to be bigger, too big, or they're not going to prune. Uh, the stand is still going to form naturally. The trees are the limb size and limb diameter and pruning is controlled by genetics. So it's going to prune up nicely and it is going to definitely make a stand that you can be proud of. Again, going back to the first photo there, there's going to have to be some type of um, inlet into that where you can go uh, for those, to free those trees up. And let's face it, as we've said in the past, you can't thin your way to heaven. And in that situation, you're probably not going to be able to thin it out to where it's a decent stand producing enough saw logs and poles uh, to and not producing so much pulp wood. So in, in this graphic, as you'll see, this is an eight by eight spacing, which is 681 trees per acre. Uh, as you can see from the little dots with the rings, uh, the green, it's hard to tell in the photo, but there are little green rings around those dots, which is simulating a crown. As you have, as you see, the crown canopy in this stand has already enclosed and it's already captured it. And it's it's at this spacing with 681 trees per acre is really overstocked. Uh, the trees, if this was a real stand, the trees would be suffering. They would be looking, they would be hurting for nutrients and they would be hurting for moisture. Um, when you have a stocking like this or when you're dealing with anything, when you're dealing with anything in agriculture, uh, there is a term that is called carrying capacity. Any site uh, out there, let's say, whether you're talking about uh, cattle, wildlife, there is a term, the term carrying capacity is when you hit the limit that that site is able to support that population. I like to use the example in, uh, in cattle. So there's a saying that a cattle farmer Told, uh, gave me, I was asking how many, I was thinking about getting into the cattle business and I was asking how many cows could I support on my property? And he said, a common saying in the South is, uh, a common saying in the South is that uh, an acre, a heifer and a calf, an acre and a half. So that saying is really talking about the carrying capacity. It's saying that an acre and a half in the southeast has enough nutrients, has enough food, has enough uh, of what it needs to support one heifer and one calf. Well, like in forestry, if you have an area out there, let's say one acre, you're not going to want to go out and you're not going to want to plant a thousand stems or 681 stems per acre. Because if you get into the situation that we're in now in the southeast where we're dealing with severe drought, uh, as you'll see in this, uh, this um, 
slide. This comes from October the 10th of 2023. Uh, as you can tell, the entire Southeast, with the exception of the coastal region in Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, we're pretty much in a drought. I know here where I'm at in, in North Alabama, we have gone over 90 days without any uh, measurable rainfall. Uh, we are in a situation now to where we are starting to see not only uh, young stands, but we're starting to see mature stands start having dieback in the trees simply because there's not enough water and there's not enough nutrients to keep them fed. If you have an overstock stand in this situation and all those trees are sucking up water out of the soil, a drought situation is going to really increase the stress that those trees are under. And when you increase that stress on a pine stand, all you're doing is you're inviting southern pine beetle and uh, to come into the stand and to attack it. Southern pine beetles are attracted to, to, to stands that are stressed. They're attack, uh, attract, attracted to stands that have damaged trees. So when you have a stand that is overstocked, it's not going to be enough water in, that, in the soil if you're in a drought keep them fed, thus it's going to stress the trees and it's just going to open it up for that southern pine beetle attack. Contrary to this site where it's an 8 by 12 spacing and you got 454 trees per acre, as you see the little ground circles representing the canopies, you can see there's a lot more distance between the trees. They've got a lot more room to grow. Uh, if you find yourself, if your area is in a drought or in a situation to where they're, they're hurting for nutrients, they're hurting for water. There's going to be a lot more for, of that, those resources to go around when you have fewer stems per acre. Going to help you have a healthier stand. You're going to have good water support. You're going to have good nutrient availability for your trees. So your trees are not going to be as stressed, and it might stave off some of those attacks from pests that like to come in when the trees are stressed and there's not enough sap in the pine tree to what we call pitch out the southern pine beetle. Another great, uh, another great uh, reason for lowering your planting density is you actually decrease the probability of damage caused by your thinning uh, operation. When you have your trees spaced close together or there's not very much distance between them, it's harder for that thinner, that, that cutter, to get in when he's standing in your stand, it's harder for him to move into the stand and actually be able to move around and remove the lower quality trees without hitting some of your better quality or residual trees that they're going to leave. So if you have wider spacing, let's say you have 12, 14 feet between your, your rows of, of pines, the cutter, the cutter operator can actually move in. He can cut those trees and lay them over and bring them out. Going back to the past slide, the, the, the issue about the pest moving into the stand, there's two pests in the southeast or two beetles in the southeast. One is black turpentine beetle and the other one is the um, deodore weevil. Those insects are actually attracted to trees that have been damaged and because they attack the lower 10 feet of the bowl of the loblolly pine tree, they're, they're, they, are, they are attracted to trees that have been damaged by uh, cutters or during the thinning process. Again, more area between your trees, more space between your trees. You're going to, you're going to uh, give that cutter operator more room to operate in there and move those trees out and pull them out uh, without damaging your residual stand. Because let's face it, the bulk of your income or the bulk of your return on your on your timber stand is not going to be in your thinning. It's going to be in your, your final cut or your final harvest. That's where your higher quality products are. And if you have a lot of trees that have skint marks on, their, on the lower bowl, the lower five feet of the tree, they're not going to be as desirable for those higher quality products. Another another plus or another reason for lower planting density is you increase your wildlife habitat diversity for the stand. Most landowners that I talk to in my day-to-day -day activities, and I ask them, what is your number one objective? 
what is your objective for owning timberland and growing a stand of timber? Back several years ago, it was a resounding, I want the return on my investment, or I want to produce high quality timber to get a return on my investment. As generations pass more and more now, I hear that a lot of times the higher objective, the number one objective, instead of being timber production, is wildlife and wildlife enjoyment, uh, hunting, uh, any type of outdoor recreation. And then coming in a close second is timber production. So one problem that we run into when we're managing pine timber is once we achieve crown closure, and like on the previous slides where I showed that you had so many stems per acre and the little green circles representing the crowns, once those closed, they shaded out the understory. And the understory was not allowed to grow. So when you get to that point, there's really actually nothing in the understory for wildlife to feed on or for wildlife to uh, benefit from. With wider spacing, you're delaying that crown closure. So when you delay that crown closure, you're going to allow that browse that is in the understory to remain around a lot longer. That browse is what we call habitat. When I was in college and I was taking wildlife management courses, I was taught that food plots are not habitat. Habitat consists of bedding cover. It consists of natural forbs and forage that occur naturally in the, in the ecosystem or in the environment that the wildlife has, is accustomed to. Food plots are additive. That's not habitat. So by thinning your or lowering your planting density, you can maintain that high quality forage for your wildlife a lot longer. You'll have more deer, you'll have more turkey, you'll have more quail, and any and be able to enjoy that longer because you, again, you're not hitting that carrying capacity so quick that you're choking out the understory. You're allowing it to grow and you're benefiting a lot more of the ecosystem that makes up your area. And when we talk about that, we're including everything. So again, spacing your trees out you're allowing that the natural flora and fauna to develop and it's an all around win. It's, it's great for everything. So now we can talk about less can be more. By planting less trees, you can achieve more chip and saw at an earlier, at an earlier time in the stand. You're going to produce less pulpwood because you're gonna plant a higher genetic and you're gonna plant fewer trees per acre. So at the time, you're gonna be able to produce more chip and saw early on in the stand. When I taught at Mississippi State, I have two former students that are mill managers at New Mills in Mississippi. I asked both of them, what size tree do you want to feed your mill? One of them is in Winona, Mississippi. One of them is down in Lumberton, Mississippi. And both of the students, both of my former students came back and they told me, we want the perfect tree to feed our state-of-the-art meal. It has an 11-inch butt. Well, when I taught college, I taught that chip and saw was the big nines. So a nine-inch DBH, which is an 11-inch butt. So think about that when you're thinking about planting your trees. All right, if, you're, if, if they're going to take an 11-inch butt to feed their meal with better genetics and wider spacing, it's not going to take very long to get into that chip and saw category. And you're going, the goal is to skip that pulpwood rotation because, like I said, pulpwood markets are gone. They're horrible in some areas. And so why produce pulpwood? Your next goal by, produce, by planting less uh, trees per acre, you're going to produce more poles. Higher genetics less trees per acre, allow the trees to grow after that first thinning when you've taken out the chip and saw at say 14 years old. And yes, I can show a stand that is 14 years old in Alabama that has already been thinned. The majority of it was chip and saw size. But after that, you're gonna allow those trees to grow on into poles and they're gonna achieve that higher quality product. Again, saw timber, your three main products that are higher value. Pulpwood, low value, really don't want to produce it anymore. 
going to have a hard time getting rid of it. Chipping saw, poles, and saw timber are your goal. And that should be the goal for every, every tree farmer out uh, that, that's managing timber. Wildlife habitat, less can be more. Fewer trees per acre can equal more wildlife habitat. More understory growth. After you get the trees above, now let's face, let's let's back up. I don't want to say that you know you don't want to site prep and control that competition. You do want to control that competition at the time of planting, and you may want to do a release after that. But once those trees get above that competition and you allow that understory to grow, you're going to increase your wildlife habitat. So I don't want to make that, I don't want people to get that you know confused and say that, well, I'm saying don't do site prep. No. We need to still do the site prep, but you're going to have a lot more wildlife habitat for fawning, for quail, or for turkey, for nesting, and for quail, for foraging in that understory. Nutrient availability. Like I showed in the, in the previous slides, fewer trees per acre, you're going to uh, hit your carrying capacity a lot later. And when you hit your carrying, when you, when you extend that, you're going to have more nutrients available to the, to the trees that are there, and you're going to have more water available. So if you get in those droughty conditions, if you get into those droughty conditions, uh, you're going to have more availability there for nutrients and water to maintain that stand longer. Hunting lease value. I didn't even touch on this topic back when I was talking about wildlife habitat. Some landowners like to lease their property out for, for hunting. It helps pay the taxes on the property and it gives them an income throughout the, uh, throughout the rotation. Well, if you have better wildlife habitat, thus you have more wildlife, then you can have an increase in the value of your hunting lease. I talk to landowners all the time that lease their property for hunting and they talk about all the improvements that they make. They, they burn regularly, they control their planting density, they increase the, the quality of forage on their property, and thus that equals higher lease values for that property, and then increases their income. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, planting density, haven't really touched on genetics very much. So if you're going back, if you go back and think about how it was, how foresters and how reforestation was approached at the beginning, I've talked to some older foresters and I've asked them, how many trees did y'all plant when you first started your career in forestry? I asked one this very question yesterday and he told me, we started out planting 726 trees per acre. And he just shook his head and I said, wow, that was a lot of trees. And he said, yes, but we had a pulp market then and we could get rid of them. He said, but that's not the case today. And he said, also, when we started planting 726 trees per acre, he said, you know, genetics were not like they are today. So we had to plant a lot more stems per acre in the hopes that we might be able to thin our way to heaven. Well, it, they very quickly realized you can't really do that. Like you see in this photo here, you see the tree there in the foreground that's got fusiform rust or canarsum. See the tree behind it that's got a twisted bowl. Both of those defects occur on the first, first log of the tree or the, what's called the butt log of the tree. And that is the most valuable log in a tree. And when you have that type of defect in that log, you have drastically decreased the value of that tree and pretty much dropped it into the pulpwood category no, no matter what size it is. Well, both of those defects are controlled by genetics. So when I say let's stop, let's go back. Instead of planting more trees, let's go reverse and let's plant 544 or 435. Or even in my colleagues area in Arkansas, they're planting below 400 trees per acre. You definitely want to plant a better genetic because let's face it, if you go backwards and you're still and you're only planting 400, 435 trees per acre, but you're still planting a second gen tree or a base genetic simply because of the cost of the seedling, then you're, you're not making any improvements. You're actually going backwards because you're still planting fewer per acre, but of those fewer trees, you're still only gonna get 
20% saw logs and poles out of that stand. So you're really shooting yourself in the foot there. So like this graphic here shows of an open pollinated stand where the little green ones are saw log trees or saw timber potential trees, the yellow Ds are trees that have died and the red zeros are trees that have defects like are in the foreground of that picture that's underneath it. You've got a lot of clumps of defective trees. You're gonna have to go into these stands. You're gonna have to thin out those defective trees but in order to get the stand open and allowed to grow, you're still gonna have to take out a lot of those salt, salt timber quality trees. So you're gonna be left with a lot of gaps in the stand. Back to planting density, if you're only planting 435 trees to the acre, but you're planting a base genetic, you're really not gonna have a lot of stems left if you take out the defective ones because you're still planting a lower quality genetic. However, if you go backwards in planting density, but you plant a higher quality genetic, and let's say you plant 435 trees to the acre, out of a thousand seedlings that you're buying that are MCP or a better genetic, you're going to get two acres out of that bag of seedlings of a thousand seedlings planted. Going back to the heavy spacing or the heavy stocking, if you got, if you're planting 726 or 622 and you're planting a base genetic, you're not going to get a complete two acres out of a thousand seedlings. So again, increase your genetic, increase the genetic quality of what you're reforesting with, but back off on your planting density, like in the, the stand in this photo, and allow the trees, give them enough room to grow and allow those better genetics to express themselves as they grow. Like with this graphic, this was a stand that was planted with a higher genetic. You still have some yellow Ds because sometimes they die. You have very few non salt timber quality trees because you will have some of those in a stand, whether they occur from environmental effect or just something happened. But in this stand, when you do the thinning on these trees, you can remove on a grid system and have a more evenly spaced stand post thinning. You can either take out every other row and allow the trees to take out every, ever how you want to lay it out. You can be more uniform with your residual stand because you have a lot of very good quality trees and you're going to have very few gaps in your stand at the time of thinning. Again, using a higher quality genetic and planting fewer per acre. You cannot thin your way to heaven. So with that being said, planting season is about to start. Whether you look at it as the beginning day of school, ready or not, here it comes. So planting season is about to start uh, all across the southeast. In some places, it already has started. Uh, so get ready or not, here it comes. At ArborGen, we have a pamphlet, Seedling Care and Planting Guidelines, that we'll be glad to provide you with. It goes through the step-by-step -step process of how you need to store your seedlings, how you need to handle them, when you take shipment of them, all kind of things like that that really go into the success of your stand can and can, can positively or as equally negative impact, impact your seedling survival on how you handle them. So we provide that. We also provide at ArborGen a daily seedling planting log. If you're supervising your planters, which I highly recommend, you really need to stay out there with your planting crew. You really need to stay out there with the guys. Make sure that they are handling them correctly. They're not leaving them out in the sunlight. They're not letting them heat up and they're not letting them dry out. This planting log here really shows that you're taking the data and that is important data that you need. So if something does happen later on, you can come back and you can look at that log and determine, okay, the temperature went up or something happened on that day that could have negatively impacted the, the, uh, the performance of those seedlings. So as reforestation advisors, uh, we are at ArborGen, we are dis, uh, divided across the southeast. Uh, we have Shannon Stewart, who is in eastern Texas and southern Louisiana. He has a background in nursery. We have Greg Hay, 
who is in Arkansas. He has a background in uh, chemicals and site prep application. I am in Mississippi, Alabama, and West Tennessee. I have a background in bottomland hardwood management, plus a background in forest genetics. We have Jason Cromer, who is in Georgia and North Florida. He has a background in forestry and has also worked in nursery and, um, and genetics. We have Kylie Burdett, who is in South Carolina. She is a Clemson graduate, and she has a background in uh, remote sensing and GIS. And we also have Austin Heine, who is in North Carolina and Virginia, and he is finishing his PhD degree with, at NC State University, and he has a background in forest genetics. Each one of us have backgrounds or experience in some facet of forestry. So if you have any question whatsoever, please reach out to any of us. And if, if you reach out to me and it's a, it's a question about chemicals and site prep and I can't get you the best answer, I'll pass it off to my colleague, Greg, and he can be able to answer it for you. Likewise, if you have a question about GIS or remote sensing, Kylie is there to handle the question and we'll pass it off. We work as a team. With that being said, I'd like to thank you again, each and every one of you. I'd like to thank you all for coming out today and taking the time to be with us. Like I stated back at the beginning of the presentation, tree farming is just like agriculture and it's just like row crops. Row crops are on an annual rotation where tree farming takes several years. With row crops, they made these changes about lowering planting density and increasing genetics years ago because it is an annual crop and they see the benefit a lot sooner. In forestry, it's a little bit more delayed, but if you see the dynamics of the markets and how they're changing across the Southeast, in order for us as tree farmers, landowners like myself and foresters and timber managers, we've got to be dynamic too. And we've got to be willing to change as the markets change. And we've got to be willing to go forward and change with the demand of the products that the markets are going to have out there. The pulp markets, yes, we're having some uptick in some areas like in Mississippi, Huber is putting in a, a particle board mill in Sugarlock, Mississippi. We're having some pellet mills come in the area that are going to be using pulp wood, but their usage of pulp wood is going to be limited and it's not going to be the same as it was back when we had the paper industry that was using so much pulp years ago. That industry has moved out and it's gone. So yes, there are some things coming in, but even then, you want to change your management so that you're set to capture the markets of tomorrow. And the markets of tomorrow are all showing that they are going to be centered around saw logs, poles, and chip and saw. Because if the housing market continues like it's going, there's going to be a larger demand for interior wall products such as two by fours, that you're going to get from your chip and saw size trees, plus lumber and plywood that's going to take to build those homes going forward. Again, plant fewer trees per acre, plant a higher genetic, and you'll be ready to capture those markets when they come and get a higher return on your investment for your timber. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We have um, some questions that have been put in during the, the uh, webinar. Uh, and again, I encourage you, if you have some questions, to please go ahead and type those in. Um, I'm going to start at the top, um, and you just finished talking about pulp mills. Uh, the question's been, you know, why do you think pulp mills are closing? Is it supply or demand, or does it have to do with the paper companies no longer managing land? That's a very good question. Uh, the question basically centers around why are pulp mills closing? Without delving off into too much about uh, sensitive topics, about regulations, politics, pulp mills are closing down in this area because they are finding it harder and harder to operate with the situation that we have in the United States today. Plus, the demand for the paper products is not what it used to be. 
Um, pulp mills are finding it easier to operate in other countries or other areas where we do not have the regulations that we have. Uh, and they're able to produce the same products. So they're moving out and moving to other areas where they have more freedom to operate the way they, they want to. Uh, I'm not saying that's that's all bad. I'm not saying that's all good, but it seems to be that the pulp mills are leaving because of easier operation in other areas. Thanks, Paul. We've got another question. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, diameter of logs. We have a question here from William wanting to know why aren't larger diameter logs valued as opposed to an 11 inch butt log? That's a very good question. And to answer that, basically goes back to the technology that they're using in the sawmills. The new sawmills that are being built, one of them being in Winona, Mississippi, is one of the most state-of-the-art sawmills in, in the United States running today. Those mills are, or the machines in those mills are calibrated for a specific size log, and they can only go so high. So when you get a high degree of variation between your log sizes and you start feeding them through the mills, it takes time for those machines to be recalibrated for a different size log. Whereas if you plant a seedling that's got a genetic that is going to have less variation uh, in the size of the log that it produces, that mill is going to be able to run it that much faster because it doesn't have to be recalibrated. So people used to think that, oh, the bigger the tree, the better. Not necessarily. You can let your timber grow so long and it, let it get so big that a mill can't handle it because simply because the machines are not able to handle that size log. It all goes back to time and it all goes back to the amount of, of uniformity in the stand. They like a smaller size log because they can run them faster. They can get the product out the other end and it, it makes for a lot smoother flow. Thanks, Paul. Um, we have several more questions here. Let me find uh, the, what are the diminished, and Greg, you might handle this one. What are the diminishing returns on larger tree spacing? For instance, you showed a 10 by 10 by 8 by 12. Would 12 by 12 spacing be more advantageous in the long run, especially with respect to minimizing damage to trees during harvesting? Absolutely. Your wider spacing is going to be. Uh less subjective to uh, the insects and disease. It's also going to give you a greater uh, opportunity when it comes to harvesting your products from an operational standpoint. You're going to be able to move within that stand in a 12 by 12 spacing much easier than you can in a tighter spacing. So your economic returns are going to be much better. You're going to get a, you're going to uplift your product grade out of pulpwood to a percentage of chip and saw. And then in addition to that, uh, depending on how you thin that stand, you should be able to thin it and have less damage to your residual trees. All right. Thank you, Greg. Um, Shannon, uh, this gentleman's asking a question from Texas, so I'm going to give this to you. I have a farm in East Central Texas. My land is mo mainly clay. What type of trees will glow grow in clay? Mm, there are There are a lot of clay sites, I would say, uh, iron ore, uh, a lot of gravel. Uh, Greg can see a lot of this in Arkansas as well, different topographies. There are ways to promote loblolly growth in those areas as well. It's going to take a little more mechanical um, than normal. And it's a little more tedious, takes a little more time. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, we can certainly uh, visit in depth offline and uh, could easily take you to some places where they've been very successful. So um, honestly, it still comes back to the same thing. What's your long range plan? Uh, what do you want it to look like? Um, and, and we can just start diving into the particulars of, of that discussion and figure out a plan that would work best for you. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason Watson, I'm going to give you this one since this is a topic that we've had lots of conversations about recently. 
Is Arborgen open to guiding landowners on genetic species and density to maximize revenue from carbon credits? We've begun to set aside acres that will likely generate greater revenue over a 30 year rotation, assuming the carbon market stays around and that's a big if he says. Kathy, can you, I'm sorry, I heard it was about carbon, but the first part of the question again, what, right. like what were our thoughts behind advanced genetics? Is, is that Arbogen open to guiding landowners on oh. genetic species and density to maximize revenue from carbon credits? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, because a lot of that is going to be dictated by the, the productivity of the, you know, obviously the, uh, the genetic option that you choose. Um, I mean, obviously MCP, you know, control pollinated uh, seedlings are going to represent the highest productivity from a genetic standpoint, but then also putting it on the right trajectory so that you don't, I mean, Paul went over this during the uh, presentation, but you definitely don't want to put too many trees in there. I, I can tell you from experience and Kylie Burdett and I've seen this in person where 600 trees per acre of MCP elite has been planted and by age nine it's just a desert under there under the sand because um there's almost too many trees per acre planted you know you're taking basically what used to be planted like open pollinated genetics used to be you know frequently customarily planted at over 600 trees per acre but that's just probably too much too many trees per acre when you've got um you know, a genetic option that has such high productivity, but but also site prep is just as important, really, to launch the the stand in a proper way. So it's all those things together, really, that are going to yield more of the. If you're in a carbon type program, then you want to yield the best or the most carbon sequestration. Then you definitely want to do both things: the good site prep, and then you know, employ really good genetics. Fantastic. Thank you, Watson. Um, Austin, um, I'll throw this one your way. Should we raise or lower our planting density due to the site index of a site? In other words, lower density of site index is lower versus raising density somewhat for areas with higher site index. Right. Um, so I think that's a, a really good question. Um, and I encourage anybody else to jump in on this uh, that, that has input. but. Um, you know, I think about a range of sites. So you can have really high site index sites or really low site index sites. Um, carrying capacity, you know, is going to remain the same. So if you're putting really good genetics on a, a high site index site, I think of it like hitting the fast forward button. Um, your site index is going to cause those trees to grow faster. Um, but carrying capacity, you know, you can you're only going to sustain a certain number of trees of a certain diameter before the stand starts to crash. Um, so I think you know you're basically hitting the fast forward button um, and, and getting to uh, you know larger trees faster. Um, I do think that you know thinking about what genetics will do, um, you do have to be careful about you know not going too low um, as far as getting really big branches. Um, you know, on really productive sites, uh, I have seen genetics that uh, they'll have a tendency to either produce really big branches or more forks. And I'm talking about the far extremes, not some of the ones that we've been talking about today. Um, but, you know, genetics can misbehave uh, faster on genetics on really high productive sites. So um, I think there's a lot to it. So I guess the short answer is yes, I think you can adjust it, but in general, you know, the, the best genetics are the best performers across all sites. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I, I hope that answered that question. Uh, if anyone else wants to chime in, Paul, I saw you taking some notes. So to chime in on that, uh, Austin, um, site index, uh, high or low, uh, like Austin said, you're going to have, you're going to reach carrying capacity either way. Uh, if you have a very high side index, you're going to carry those trees. The trees are going to have more nutrients and more water availability as you go longer into the stand. Uh, with a lower side index, you're definitely not going to want to plant as many per acre because you're going to be limited per, you're going to be limited on the availability of the nutrients and the water that's there. Uh, so again, 
regardless of what your site index is, you're still going to want to back off on that planting density uh, because you're going with low site index, fewer trees per acre, they're going to carry longer, higher site index, you know, have more nutrients and more resources for those better quality genetics. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Austin. Um, Jason Cromer, this uh, this question is from Alabama, so I'm going to throw it your way. How does the growth rate of MCP variety trees differ from the South Alabama area than in West Alabama, depending on site in there? Oh, uh, yeah, there's some <clears throat> areas, excuse me, in South Alabama that has some really good land, and we've seen MCP select trees grow as fast as uh, pushing 10, 12, 14 foot tall by the end of year three kind of deal. So um, I can't speak to the North Alabama area that Paul probably can. Um, and there's just some, it definitely depends on your site. So your souls and it, like Austin was saying a while ago, it just depends on what your site index is and what your souls are. And it's going to affect how at the rate that they're going to grow. So my, my main answer is it varies. Um, and Paul can maybe speak to some, what he sees in um, North Alabama. So as far as across the different regions of Alabama, uh, the higher genetics are going to be catered to your area. So if you're in Southeast Alabama and you're needing a, a family that you want to grow uh, a particular way, you're definitely going to want to make sure that, that you select a family that is, has got that. And that goes back to looking at your PRS scores. So to answer your question, how it varies, you can really lower the variation and the differences by just matching the genetic with your area, making sure you've got the PRS sheets, make sure you've got all the data that you need to make that decision. And as RAs, we can help you with that decision because we can help you understand the difference in the families that you're getting. Uh, instead of just buying what used to be a second or third gen tree, now as technology has gone and it's, has it, as it has advanced in reforestation, we select families. So again, back to the original question of how it varies across the state, you're going to see a little variation if you match the family to the region, and we'll be glad to help you with that. Thanks, Jason and Paul. Um, Kyle, this one uh, is a gentleman who's been talking to you about replanting 165 acres, and he's uh, he's wanting to know the personal preference on the spacing, 10 by 10 or 8 by 12, which is which one is easier for machine planting? Um, that can really just depend, you know, talk to your machine planner, see what they prefer to run. You may have some stumps or something where it may prevent doing that certain spacing. Um, I'm a fan of the eight by 12, the 454. Um, I know in some areas like where Paul and Greg are, Greg could even go down to Greg, what's your, what's your ideal spacing that you like to like to hit? Well, again, it, a lot of variables are in play there. Is it going to be hand planted? Is it going to be machine planted? What kind of site prep did the track have on it? A, a lot of variables, but I do like 14 foot rows from an operability standpoint and from a growth standpoint, looking at 346 trees to the acre, uh, up to 389 trees to the acre. So it, it definitely varies in certain areas. And I'm I checked, I saw your question. I recall us, us talking about that. So in, in your area with your current markets, to me, machine planning at a eight by 12 is the ideal way to go, especially with those larger um, spaces in between rows. I will jump in just for a second and mention to you that with um, one of the things that is good, I, I like the 10 by, I think a lot of people like the 10 by 10 certainly uh from every tree is going to have the same square foot square footage excuse me lose my voice but but I, I agree with kylie and greg on the wider spacings between rows because you know when you think about things like fuel cost right now that's fewer times that that bulldozer or that tractor has to go across uh, it's fewer rows fewer passes per acre you can think about it and so there are several contractors out there too that'll tell you that 
if I can go from a 10 foot wide row to a 12 foot or 14 foot wide row, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. Um, cause it's fewer times that, you know, that my machine has to turn around and less fuel. I mean, that, people tell you that too on mechanical site prep. Um, and that's the good thing about control pollinated genetics that have really good, you know, br branch genetic control and, you know, branch stability at wider spacings. That's, you get a lot more flexibility because of, um, because of that genetic control. Right. Thanks guys. Still got a lot of questions here, so I'm going to put this out. Since we're getting close to tree planting season, um, I planted Arborgen MCP pines a few years ago. The tree planter agreed to plant 605 trees per acre. I ordered 605 trees per acre. The tree planter had three planters and B blade bulldozers. The planters were set up to plant on six foot space, spacing. The previous stand was 10 foot spacing. They didn't want to ride on the stump, so I ended up with 726 trees per acre. I had to locate more seedlings. I believe this is common. How do you get a tree planter to plant less trees per acre in this situation? So I'll see, me. I see a lot of people smiling, so um, go ahead, Paul. Thanks a lot, Jason. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is a, uh, a very interesting topic uh again it just takes uh communication uh that's a million dollar question on how to get someone to 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 do something like that um uh, maybe maybe communication up front uh maybe uh you know make it clear as to what you want uh again um not not to uh to uh Brush, rub someone the wrong way or brush, you know, be controversial here, but you're the client, uh, you're the landowner. So uh, uh, just have the open communication up front. Uh, you know, this is what you want. This is, this it's, it's, uh, I like to use the analogy, it's your masterpiece, it's your painting. You paint it the way you want to paint it because you're the painter. Uh, and that may end up having to be some, some tough conversations, but Again, um, you may have to have those up front. Uh, we run into the same situation, uh, attendees. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's always as easy as just going out there and saying, I want this many trees per acre because we run into the same situation when you have cost share programs. And a cost share program comes out and it says that, that you've got to have a minimum of 622 trees per acre. And we have been trying to work with the cost share people for a long time, trying to uh, get it passed through and get people to understand that that is old technology that has come and gone. And the way it's going in the future is fewer trees per acre with a higher genetic. And it's just going to take people getting up to speed and getting up to date and willing to change uh, because sometimes that is. Uh, it's hard to get that pushed through. Uh, I've had multiple conversations with NRCS uh, uh, individuals and with uh, SAF, the Society of American Foresters, and I have tried getting those two groups together to where, and I'm still trying. I haven't given up on it. We as a company are still trying to get that pushed through to where the cost share programs are up to date. But I have had clients tell me that they had a good conversation with their agent or they had a good conversation and they were saying, oh, they, they said, okay, we understand you're planting a better genetic and you're planting fewer per acre for a better stand. And it was able to work through. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Cromer, does, how does bare root versus containerize affect planting density or does it? Mm, well, when I think of that, I try to think of, well, I'm, Imagine most people probably try to think of survival first, um, but I try to think of what's going to be there at the end of the stand. Um, so there is, you could potentially put a few more trees out there to the acre with bare root if you're anticipating uh, worse survival. Um, we also have some data that shows that, um, and we're, we're more than happy to share this and show you contact us, but um, uh, typically like survival needs to get down 
worse than 60% for it to make sense for to start spending money on containers. We don't want to see you waste money at all um because we're trying to think for the end of the rotation for you here so you're still going to want to shoot for uh, a lower spacing uh even with bare root um it's, it's, we're wanting to think end of the rotation here um just like paul was saying stress it less stress throughout the growing of the entire stem uh so i don't know if that fully answers your question or not but uh, i'd say um, if you got a trend on what you know your survival is on your sites, that, um, if you're blessed enough to have that, um, then you could bump up just a little bit, depending on what that mortality is, um, kind of deal. If you're not, um, kind of somebody said earlier, if you can get on site and supervise what's going in on the ground, um, uh, with bare root. Um, make sure it's deep enough, planted properly, um, and try to early enough in the year and not plant late. Um, you're going to be okay with bare root, um, very much so. So I wouldn't be skittish of it. Is what I'll say. I'd also I'd also like to chime in, Cromer, and say that just because you're planting a container doesn't necessarily mean you're planting a better genetic. There are a lot of containers that are sold and planted every year that are a base genetic. And that goes back to the presentation where I was talking about uh, if you're backing off on your planting density and you're still planting the same genetic you was planting, you're just planting fewer pulpwood trees per acre. And that's what they're going to be. Uh, I like to use the example. A lot of times if you take a if you take a weed and put it in a pot and plant it, you still have a weed. Uh, if you're planting, if you're investing the money into containers uh, and you're not investing money into the genetic that is in that container, then you're really not doing, you're not improving your, your, your end result anyway. You're not doing anything any better. Not every site out there is going to require a containerized seedling. Containers get you survival, but that's all they get you. They get you a longer planting window, window but that's all they get you. Uh, there, there are areas out there that I have visited with landowners and they say, well, we're considering containers. And my first response was, please do not spend that extra money on a container on the site where you're planting in a floodplain. You've got ample uh, water availability. You're, you're not on a high ridge. You're not on a very deep sandy site. Bare root is going to be, is going to be fine. Take that extra money and put it into a higher genetic. Uh, and you'll be a whole lot happier on the other end. Uh, so again, just because you're planting a genetic, and I've had people and landowners and foresters tell me in the past, oh, that had a gen that had a container tree on that. That's better. That's a better tree. And walking through the stands, I see just as much fusiform rust defects. And basically, what they did was they planted a containerized base genetic and they instead of helping their sales they just spent more money for what they were replanting with to get the same results and Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results um Paul I'd, I'd like to build off of what you and Cromer said you know, the southwide average on bare root survival, we like to say is around 85%. And what you were talking about with maybe a lower quality genetic container versus a advanced genetics and MCP bare root, you know, you're you're looking at your return on investment. And if you had a hundred percent survival with your lower quality container and 85 to 90% survival with your bare root MCP, you're going to have a much higher ROI. And that's really where it lies. You, you know, at, we all look and say, we want an instant result. We want to, we want to see a hundred percent survival in this stand, but really, you know, we're not getting paid for, uh, you know, seedling that this is this tall. We're getting paid for that 11 inch, but our, and we're really going that way. So being able to look into the future and not focus so much on that is really where, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that about the container versus bare root. And then also it depends with the bare root too. Are you planning on beds? Are you machine planning? 
um, like Paul said, the the soil moisture, where where are you with that? And those are so many other factors. So really with a container, there's a very, very small amount of stands out there that absolutely re absolutely require you to plant a container, in my opinion. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also like to follow up what Kylie was saying. If you do want to look at stuff as far as the financials and your return on your investment, um, all of anybody on this team would be happy to go through that with you. We have a seedling calculator that we can we can punch in the cost of what the containers would be, uh, what it would be for bare root as well, and uh, we can give you a ballpark idea of how much revenue you would have versus the two. So we'd be glad to do that with any of y'all. What great conversation, guys. We've run over a little bit, but there are a couple more, I think, really good questions on density that I'd like to put out there. And please remember, folks, that uh, we have copies of your questions. If you didn't get your question answered and you put your contact information in when you signed up, we will get you to the right RA and we'll get their your question to them and they can contact you to get your questions answered. But um, this one I thought from um, Jackson Jet was really interesting. There are discussions about taking trees per acre down to densities as low as 200 stems per acre. What is the relationship between stem quality and tree density? Does this vary by family? I'm not sure. So that's a okay. go ahead. Go, no, go, Paul. I was trying to figure okay. out. So I, I'm I'm taking that that uh, if I understand the question correctly, he's he's talking about lower planting density with quality, and I assume that may, he's meaning the quality of the wood, or the or in relationship with the um, fast growth. Would would the other RAs agree that that's y'all? And if if that is the case, you know you're talking about um, um, trees a type of tree, a loblolly pine tree that, that grows fast at the beginning of its years, regardless of genetic. And really the only way to slow that down is just to plant them so thick. Again, planting a better genetic uh, at that lower spacing, you're still going to have the good quality wood. Uh, a publication put out by Dr. McKean out of NC State titled Good Wood uh, discuss this very topic. And he talks about in that publication that, you know, the, the comments about uh, fast grown plantation wood equaling poor quality lumber is simply not true. Uh, those two meals that I referenced where I have talked to the procurement managers on both of those, they said the size log they wanted was an 11 inch butt, but they also went on to say they didn't have an age limit and they didn't have a ring count limit. So again, they're they're basing it more on size instead of of that. Um, going down to that lower density is going to get you uh, a lot more higher quality products. Now, we're by no means condoning that you go down to an extreme case of less than two hundred trees to the acre or something like that. Uh, we're nowhere going to that to that level. But what we are saying is going down to uh, 435, 350, something in that range, you're still going to have ample quality wood out there. Well, I think, yeah, Paul, I think we need to mention too for those that are still on is that one thing that instead of just trying to, to make a guess too is we, we got some really good information from the Plantation Management Research Co-op that did some really important density uh, studies back in the gosh in the 80s and the 90s and they found that there was there was very little difference between and they did they did all kind of um they did some really cool stuff i mean they planted 100 trees per acre all the way up to a thousand trees per acre but the the peak in terms of the volume per acre was between 400 and and 800 and there was very little difference um, in the total volume per acre up through the, I think it was age 14, but, and that was, I think Barry Shiver and Leon Pinar and Mike Harrison did that. Right. Study. So that was really, really important where it showed us, but, but, but further than that, if, if you can't tell the overarching theme of this, of this webinar has been that you can take advantage of 
going in with lower stocking because of the availability of advanced genetics and the better genetic control at those lower stocking rates. And, um, but at least we can have, we have good studies though, to show us that if we're going down to 400 trees per acre and saving money on, on seedlings, we can feel encouraged that we're growing the same amount of volume as if we were growing, you know, 700 trees per acre, the way they used to be planted, like Paul mentioned earlier. But there's no, but sense, also, there's no sense in planting that many trees because right. we we, we'd like to hit the chip and saw uh, category as soon as we can. And um, because at those higher densities, you're just going to be growing smaller trees and you may not have a market for those. And, and this is all market dependent too, but, but those are, that's just some background information on, uh, we're not taking guesses with this. This is, there's been some real good empirical, some empirical studies that have been done to show all this to be, to get us to where we are today. And it's just that we've layered on the uh, op much better genetic options than we've ever had before. But also, Jason, in that study, they showed that between 400 stems per acre and 1,000, they had roughly the same board foot volume on the stand. But the stand that had 400 trees per acre had an enor enormous amount more. Well, the 1,000 stems per acre had zero saw timber. The stand that had 400 stems per acre, even though it was the same board footage, had uh, a large 90-something 90, 90 percent saw timber in that stand um again same volume different product class all right guys we've gone way over and uh so i think we better call it quits thank you again all for joining us today uh, we look forward to putting these on hope you got some great information um i believe we've got a slide or can put a slide up with the contact information for the ras that you've seen on this, the webinar today please feel free to get in touch with them to follow up with any questions that you have. And again, we will uh, take a look at all the questions that were submitted and try to get them to the right RA if you've given us your uh, contact information. So thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.